You are listening to South Niagara Conversations, a podcast presented by the South Niagara Chambers of Commerce, along with 105.1 The River and 101.1 More FM. Here are your hosts, Dolores Fabiano and Scott Lunn. All right. Well, good morning and thanks to everyone who's joined us for our South Niagara Conversation series. For those of you who are tuning in from afar, we represent the communities of Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, Port Coburn, Waynefleet, Welland and Pelham. We're located in Southern Ontario, a wonderful place to live, work, and play. Good morning, Scott. How are you this morning, Mr. Lunn? Good morning, Dolores. I'm very well. I'm preparing for a long weekend of nothing to really do. Yeah, I hear you, brother. It's uh, it's gorgeous out there right now. I, uh, I was telling you earlier, the plans are to open the pool this weekend, uh, but the minute we get it open, I think we're in for nine days of straight rain, so... Just, just add it to the list, right? <laughs> add it to the list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, at least my, at least was hockey to watch. Life's not too bad. Sure. Sure. We'll, we'll go with that. Sounds good. Uh, I also uh, want to give a shout out to our tech sponsor, uh, Brian LaChapelle from B4 Networks. Brian and his team always make us sound so good. And if you need uh, any expertise with your technology, they're the folks to call. Brian, how are you this morning? I'm doing well, very well. Thank you. It's Friday and I'm happy to know that the weekend is coming. Yes, I'm with you. I am with you. So this morning we're going to be discussing, um, well, actually we're going to focus on some of the challenges in managing a municipality throughout the uh, pandemic. How do you continue to provide core services with reduced resources and maintain community spirit and engagement all at the same time? Uh, Mr. Lunn, I think uh, municipal CAOs across the world would likely um, have all have an interesting story to tell. I know that we have two of South Niagara's finest uh, joining us this morning. So let's get to it. Uh, who do we have joining us this morning? You bet, Loris. We've got a couple of real, really smart guys who can uh, run the operation with us this morning. Uh, Scott Louie, who is the CAO for the city of Fort Colburn, and David Cribb, CAO for the town of Pelham. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this last uh, year and a bit is, I can't even imagine how tough it's been. And I know there's been some tough decisions that have had to be to be made uh, running a municipality, uh, which essentially is running a business, a very big business. Um, maybe we'll just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how tough it's been having to turn things around so quickly when the pandemic hit and then managing through lockdowns and restrictions and then more lockdowns and everything. So um, just based on cool name, we'll start with you, Scott. Maybe if you can just give us a little, uh, <laughs> no offense, Dave, uh, just give us a little breakdown. of how Pedal's we're... still good, right? <laughs> uh, good morning, Scott. Yes, I appreciate it. We're Scott, we're, we're Scott twins today. Uh, David is one of the coolest CAOs, probably the coolest CAO in all of Niagara, but we have the cool names. Right. He's um, an award winner as well, but we'll get to that later. For sure. So uh, it's a great question, um, and just to sort of do a free-form answer, and, and I'll try to connect my thoughts and not be all over the place and save some time for David. Uh, 1025, you can start, David. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, one of the tough things with us was clarity around the provincial announcements. Like, a lot of times it's a vague announcement that comes down, and we are left holding the bag on interpretation. Um, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to talk about something that was even harder and that's, you know, and it's confusing, I think, sometimes for the, for, the, for the community to understand is we are the city. We are, you know, the provider of recreation services and library services and all of the different services we provide. But we're a workplace, too. So we have to put precautions in for our employees. We have to make sure we have enough money to pay our employees, you know, in the face of shrinking revenues because municipal facilities that earn revenue were closed um, health and safety, you know, taking care of employees who are sick, whether it's from COVID or something else, and uh, reconciling those two important roles, the role as, as the, the municipal administration for the, for the residents and businesses and visitors, as well as the employer role. So that was, that was tough in the early stages of the pandemic. I'm not sure what Pelham's experience was. Uh, well, Dave? Good segue. Uh, so Pelham has 105 full-time staff, and then on top of that, 90 volunteer firefighters, uh, seasonal employees, students, uh, puts that over 200, but 105 is sort of as a permanent core, if you will. 
And for us, uh, we've, we're very proud to host the Meridian Community Center, beautiful facility um, that, sorry about that. Uh, you know, two t twin pad ice surfaces, NHL size rinks, et cetera, et cetera, um, real gem. But it's such a large asset it's by far and away the biggest thing in town, the most expensive building ever constructed there. And it has a, a, a very large number of our staff. So when we were ordered closed, ultimately for us, uh, it meant 33 layoffs and then layoffs as well at the library system. On So at 33 out of 105, when we had the library staff, we were in the 40s as far as layoffs go. So we, I mean, that was the, the corporate response. And, and the big part of the challenge, and I say this to all the people out there listening, uh, you know how difficult it is to lay people off. who They've done nothing wrong. They don't deserve this to be happening. What, so it has nothing to do with job performance. It has nothing to do with skill, capacity, dedication, none of those things. Just this tidal wave that hit all of us that none of us saw coming. Uh, so that certainly the challenge, uh, because as Scott said, we just have this need to be fiscally responsible. And for us, since REC is so disproportionately large because of the MCC and sort of how we operate and how we're structured, uh, that meant our revenue was disproportionately affected to the negative because it went to zero. And uh, this, I mean, relative to prior to that happening in January and February uh, last year, uh, prior to COVID hitting, uh, we were at getting 3,500 people a day in on the weekends. And on a population of 18,000, you know, you'd have 8,000 people there between Friday and Sunday. Uh, you know, those numbers are spectacular. They're well beyond what we thought we could achieve. And of course, and ultimately, not every person who comes in provides revenue, but we do drive revenue ultimately as a result of high usage. So, on the corporate side, we, we had to sort of do those pieces, but then th there's the health and safety stuff Scott referenced. Uh, there's uh, an issue of staff morale, mm -hmm. and there's the the all the the other side of our services, uh, you know, public works, the essential stuff, plowing the roads, keeping salting and sanding them, keeping people safe, all of that fire, you know, all those things. We still have to rush to the calls, and trying to figure out how to do that safely. Um, particularly before the vaccine started rolling out, was a real challenge. You know, it's extra PPE for all the firefighters. It's that extra PPE for the public works staff. It's it, trying to figure out how to deliver those. Those were the, the real challenges. And I'm really happy to say the communication between the municipalities uh, was really spectacular during this pandemic. Uh, I was only here for a little while prior to the pandemic. Uh, and I, wouldn't have said it was a really close federation in Niagara. I think um, certainly, obviously, it used to be in the cards that maybe we were going to amalgamate into a single tier, because partially because we weren't necessarily all getting along well in the sandbox. And I think, uh, you know, everyone's in the same foxhole. And the cooperation and the collegiality and the municipal intermunicipal support have been really spectacular. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of that too across the chamber world as well, where, you know, we're all just working together to uh, provide the best services we can. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the the Meridian Center and, and uh, Mr. Louie, in Fort Coburn, we have the Valley Center. And I have to tell you, um, last Friday, uh, right after the podcast, uh, my husband and I made our way to va the Valley Center for our uh, first vaccine. Mm -hmm. And then on Tuesday, my daughter uh, went to the Meridian Center in Pelham to get hers. And I have to tell you, it, it makes me so happy to see those beautiful facilities being utilized for this purpose. Um, you know, they're, they're gorgeous facilities. They're well used in both communities. Um, it, 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 you know, it's heartbreaking to see them, them closed for any length of time. And so with this opportunity to, to give people hope and a vaccine, it's great to, to utilize those businesses. And actually in Port Colburn, when, uh, when we um, left, I think it was the, the fire department who was outside and they were handing us, uh, first of all, they were high-fiving everyone and giving us all complimentary uh, hand sanitizer. It just it was such a great experience, but uh, I wanted to make mention of those two facilities because they're important to, to both the communities um, just in regular times um, and, and during times of crisis, it's great to, to see that we can put them to use and, and um, 
you know, get people through the building for, for a really good purpose. Yeah, that was. Yeah, uh, we, in Port Colborne, we tried um, to work really well with the regional public health and it's absolutely their, their baby. They're doing a great job of running it. I've heard nothing but good comments, but we wanted to be a good partner. Um, and when we, we first got them in there, they were doing about, they were, their capacity was about a thousand doses a day. And last week, the week that you went, I think we would have had five or six days of vaccinations. And it's easy to sit back and say, well, why aren't they closer to my house? Why isn't there one in municipality X or Y? But we were able to retool with them and increase our capacity to 1500 per day. And we, we're just able to process so many people. And you're right. We've had some members of the community, developers and whatnot, step up and donate masks and sanitizer. And we sort of tackled it as a problem. How, what's the best way to get this into the hands of the folks in the community? And we, we started with a drive-through pickup at the fire hall. But when the vaccine clinic started, we said, this is great. We can meet them right on the scene. There's a medical presence because the firefighters are first responders at the vaccination clinics. It just works in so many ways. So I'm glad you had a good experience. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, you know, one of the most joyous, this sounds strange, but one of the most joyous yes. occasions that I've had in the past year and, and, and a half, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but I think we're all in the same boat. And, uh, you know, I dropped my daughter off uh, to get her vaccine and I waited. And when she came out, it was the same thing. She had a big smile on her face and she said, mom, that was fantastic. Like it was boom, boom, boom. Um, what a beautiful facility. What a great experience. So uh, uh, kudos to everyone involved because it, yeah. it was a great experience for, for me anyways. Yeah. Um, so I know that um, you guys, as, as the CEOs, um, probably get a lot of, I don't want to say hate, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of, you know, the decisions that are made, people don't understand that, um, you know, the, that those aren't decisions that you guys as CEOs are just, you know, making, that there's a lot of um, protocols that you follow, that council at the end of the day has the final decision. And that, you know, when you are closing facilities, it's, um, or, or canceling programs and whatnot, it's really based on a lot of information that you have to consider. Can you guys talk to that a little bit? And sure. we can start with you, Scott. Sure. Um, it's a great, it's a great question. I know you and I have talked about it offline in the past. It's, it, it is a little bit that provincial interpretation piece that I mentioned. Uh, and it's a little bit public scrutiny and public perception that that feeds into the issue and, and confusion and, and, and a lack of awareness. And then it's people's personal, you know, preferences and needs. You know, some people, if you don't use the library, you don't care that the library is closed. If you don't have a boat, you don't care that the boat ramp is open. And the hard thing for us, I, I, it's, I say it half tongue in cheek, uh, it's a joke, but it's not really a joke, is that when we decide to do something, close something, open something, you know, 40% of the people think we're idiots for opening it. 40% of the, the, the people think like they don't care that we opened it. They're like, finally, like, like they're, they're angry that it wasn't open sooner. And the other 20% just think that we can't do anything right anyway. So when you get something like a boat ramp, for example, launching your boat on Lake Erie, um, it's, it's tough. And it, and it comes from the provincial orders. The, prov the province said, if you operate a marina, you shall not permit it to be used for recreational boating. Clear as a bell, right? Mm -hmm. Except is the marina, the boat ramp, is the boat ramp the marina? And, and so we were left to interpret that. And of course, you're going to make half the people happy and half the people angry with that because we do get phone calls from people who say, I don't want the boat ramp to be open. I don't want people coming into the municipality when there's a stay at home order. So social media isn't our friend right now. <laughs> um, you know, we're trying our best to communicate to folks that, the, you know, if it's, a, if it's a local decision, the rationale behind the decision, and if it's a provincial decision, the fact that it wasn't made at the local level. The other thing that we do really, really well, uh, David already touched on this, is the CAOs are talking at least once a week, sometimes more um, on Zoom. You know, I've never seen such good cooperation between the lower tiers and the regional CAO, acting CAO is right there as well. The fire chiefs are speaking, the, the CEMCs, those are the emergency management coordinators are speaking. Public health has a weekly call. Um, there's very, very good cross, cross municipality discussions. So we'll talk about, is your farmer's market open? 
okay, where's your legal interpretation? Okay, we're going to open hours too. Or are you guys shutting down this? You know, are you taking your rice out? Okay, we'll take our rice out too. And uh, that cooperation has really helped to make sure there's consistency, not always perfect consistency, but that's okay. But some consistency across boundaries. Yeah, Zoom has really um, allowed us to do that a lot better, I think. As much as we complain about Zoom and, uh, and you know, uh, digital platforms to meet, I think it's really made us um, um, efficient in terms of meeting because, you know, the meetings are, are, are quick. They can happen at any time. You can hop on, you take care of business, and then you you move on. And I, and I think Zoom is, is here to stay for a long, long time. Dave, we uh, want to hear what you have to say on this topic, too. You know, the key thing, and really ought to give a good shout out to council, the, the truth is regardless of whether a decision is made at the political level or at the administrative level by Scott or I or our equivalents, uh, the reality is we're the third order of government in a country that has three orders of government, or we're the fourth if it's a regional municipal yep. item. And whether we're talking health regulations in a pandemic or land use planning and development, uh, different or, you know, it, if it's a pandemic, the federal government sets some rules, the provincial government sets some rules. We look to the expertise at Niagara Regional Public Health for the interpretation of how to operationalize those. And then we try to cooperate either council to council or CAO to CAO and how we're going to deliver those and, and aim for some amount of consistency throughout the region. But you have to understand that either way, uh, for plenty of decisions, two thirds of the decision is already made or two thirds of the rules are already in place before either our councils or Scott or I even ever get to put our fingerprints on the item and the issue. So I say that to those who are dissatisfied with any particular policy or decision or implementation, I completely understand that there's a lot to be unhappy with in the world at the moment, but the amount of local decision making, depending on what we're talking about, can be extremely small, uh, almost to the point of being an afterthought. The table's already set, and the only question is, what order are you eating the food on, the, on your plate, right? Because that's already been served. Yeah. Um, sorry. sorry, I thought you were done. You, you breathed, and I tried to sneak did, in on your breath. That's a fatal uh, mistake I won't make again. <laughs> yeah. You gotta go really fast. No, I was going to jump in on what you said, if that's okay, David, because it's, Please. you know, I said at the start of the pandemic, and I hope this is okay to say publicly, because it was an internal conversation, you know, the province is going to go back to Queens Park, the region, God bless them, we love them, they're going to go back to St. David's Road, and we're going to be left holding the bag with our relationship with our residents, businesses, visitors, and so on. And so that's why the approach that we took at the beginning was very much uh, around education and information. We didn't go into businesses with a ticket book. We didn't, you know, lay charges and fines uh, right off the hop. We because at the end of the day, we wanted to maintain good relations with our constituents. So we went in there and said, "Hey, do you understand that you can't be at full capacity? Do you understand that people have to line up?" You know, we helped. We never told retailers or other businesses what to do but we helped them figure out what to do on their own. If it like some, and, and we all know, you, you go to one grocery store and the aisles are one way aisles, you go to another grocery store and they're making people wait outside. And so everybody came up with their own plans, but we tried to facilitate that and make sure that the community had a good handle on it. Sorry, David, back to you. <laughs> no, I think you nailed it. <laughs> well, so, but to, but to that point, and, and, and I know, you know, as you stated, uh, social media is not, not, not your friend and uh, it can be, it can be an enemy for, for just about anything these days, but how do you, how, I mean, communication uh, is so key during something that is so confusing with the various levels and the ever changing story. How, what has been the tactic to try to stay, I don't know if you can stay ahead of it, but to keep up with it so that that message is, is sent out to uh, constituents and people in, in your community. Well, for Pelham, I can say we've taken a couple of different tacks. One, we've, uh, we've engaged with a new software product uh, that allows us to greatly sort of increase and enhance our public, our interactions with the public. So from, from surveys to real-time commentaries, um, uh, allowing people in to see our documents better, it does a whole bunch of stuff. But we're really trying to 
uh, effectively and meaningfully engage with people and give them a, a, a chance to really talk to us and let us know what's what's bothering them. So that's you know one component of, of how to address that. And I think all of the Niagara area municipalities, I certainly don't think Pelham was alone in this, have done their best to some content, st- talking about say recreation is always, that's, that's home stuff for the local area municipalities. But the health information, most of our stuff was links to Niagara Public Health or the provincial government, for instance. Uh, the things where you don't have primary responsibility, I think really it's our job to explain explain that we don't, give effective referrals. Online, it's relatively easy with links, but if, whether it's people calling us, uh, you know, we just had staff prepped with, here's, here's where you send people for this problem, here's where you send them for that one, and make sure they're effective referrals. And those are sort of things that let, uh, it doesn't mean that people are any happier, but you can certainly help them get to the so- proper source of the information, or if we are the proper source of the information, uh, for us, the better engagement sort of allows us to give more fulsome answers and hopefully help people at least understand, even if they don't specifically agree. Mm-hmm. Scott, Tim, uh, how about yourself? Yeah, so Port Colborne's kind of blessed. We have two of the greatest comms officers in all of Niagara, maybe all of the world. Uh, chamber members will know Michelle, and Michelle is, is the, gr- the greatest. And she just she's a new position that was created two or three years ago. And she was here for the first half of the pandemic and went on a mat leave. And her mat leave replacement was just as good as her. And we've actually already offered to extend her beyond the mat leave and make her position full time. And and these uh, communicators, they do a great job on social. They're very good at taking a message and making it accessible to the user. So you'll notice our communication is a lot less government speak, a lot less thou shalt not and more in order to keep everyone safe, we must, you know, so we, we're trying to put a positive spin on our messages. The second thing I will say, and this is part of the city's new strategic plan is improving communication in all ways, shapes and forms, which includes in reach, how people get a hold of us. And we did what everyone did a few years ago. We went to a, an auto attendant on our phone system. So you had to press one for planning and nine for building. And, you know, you had to know a person's extension even though it was your first time calling them. And after the election, our council was very keen to, to get to back to live answering. So, and un, unrelated to COVID, we live answer every single phone call to city hall. Now there's a, there's a quick recorded message that says, hang on, you're gonna get a person. And every call is live answered. We're keeping statistics. And during the pandemic, most queries are answered within two minutes and most of them are answered without being transferred to another person. So that the, our customer service representatives and or I should say community support representatives, CSRs, are um, trained not just to transfer the call, but to solve the, the reason for the call within mm. the call. And it's helped us a lot during the pandemic. You know, I, I think, and we've, Mr. Lund, had this conversation before with other um, panelists on other podcasts, but I think, um, you know, what, what this pandemic has showed us is that some of the things that we were doing where it was, you know, efficiency and faster and wasn't necessarily better. And uh, even as we're planning for, you know, uh, post pandemic um, things that we're going to be doing, it's really about getting back to some of those basic things, you know, where, where someone does answer your, your call and you can have a conversation. Um, So it's interesting that um, you guys were already going in that direction before the pandemic. And also, you know, five years ago, uh, even some of the larger um, communities here in Niagara didn't have a communications uh, staff person. Yeah. Um, and now you're going to have two and, 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 you know, it looks like this is going to be a, a priority for everyone. And I think that's important because uh, today you can c- communicate in so many ways. And, uh, you, you know, the way you communicate with someone who's 75 years old is very different than the way you communicate with someone who's 25 years old. But, you know, yeah. your citizens are are in all of those groups. And so you have to figure out a way to uh, communicate effectively with um, with a very diverse group. So, yeah, yeah a good plan. Um, I know that uh, both of you, uh, both municipalities run very, very successful Farmers markets. 
So uh, citizens in both Port Colborne and Pelham really look forward uh, to the farmer's market. Um, in Port Colborne, it's Friday mornings. In, in Pelham, it's uh, Thursday afternoons, and it usually leads into um, entertainment at the band shell. Uh, what's happening with the farmer's market in both of your communities? What's Just tell me the start date. <laughs> well, that's actually a great question. I'll jump in first, David, if that's okay. Today is the day. Today is the opening Yay. of the Port Colborne downtown farmer's market. It is, uh, but this is, there's a, there's a, a nuance to it. In the winter time, we were approached by the business improvement area. That's the downtown BIA. And they have offered to help administer it, or I guess to take over the administration of it for uh, a trial period to see if there's uh, improvements to be made. So our farmer's market has always been great. Great mix of produce, prepared food, um, you know, uh, flowers and, and, and other products, you know, you get everything, maple syrup and honey, and it's so great. I'm usually there on my coffee break on Friday morning buying my groceries for home. Um, but they sort of said, look, what if we did this? And what if we did that? And how can we up the game and make it more of a, a like a destination and attract people from outside of the community? And, and so they're starting today. Unfortunately, we're restricted to agriculture only during the stay at home order. We can't have the crafters and non agricultural products, but we have super high hopes for how well it's gonna go after the stay at home order is over. And that's every Friday directly across from city hall. I'm gonna put a plug in yeah. uh, until 1230 or so. They start to break down around 1230, one o'clock, but you wanna be there probably before noon. Mm -hmm. um, we have public health precautions in place and we're able to operate and only going to go up from here. Yeah, I typically, I, I want to hear from Dave too. I typically grab dinner uh, Thursday nights at the market in Pelham and, and Fridays I head over to Port Colburn for my lunch. So yeah, it's not pretty, but uh, go ahead, Dave. Tell us about your farmer's market. Well, you know, in the spirit of intermunicipal cooperation, I want to invite our friends at Port Colburn to come on up. Uh, to Pelham and just and see we'd be happy to take you under our wing we've uh, we've run for two weeks uh, in fact last night made week number three uh, it's going well again uh, historically you're right it uh, the farmer's market led into the supper market which led into the Thursday night concert series so you had groceries followed by followed by dinner followed by live music which was a, a great thing the, the pandemic doesn't quite allow us to do that now uh this year we're calling it the summer chill series and uh there is a way to sort of uh you can actually book reserve a, a picnic table uh and come and uh with some careful guidelines there is a way to uh, to actually eat at uh, at the summer chill series so we're uh, we're pretty proud of that uh at the moment, due to space and considerations, we're, uh, we're at 10 vendors, whereas historically we'd be at 16. So that's, uh, that's somewhat reduced, but I would say that fundamentally, as with Port Colburn, it's a really good spread of, uh, you know, mix of products, uh, you know, straight from, from the farm and others that have been uh, manufactured and value added to them. So uh, ni nice variety. Uh, Thursday start, starts about four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, the summer chill, there is a, a way, uh, if you call ahead, uh, to, in fact, uh, make a booking and, and have a table for yourself and those in your bubble. So uh, kind, of a, kind of a nice thing going on there. Yeah, it sounds great. And, and actually, that's um, really great news because, um, you know, I, I, I know that citizens um, were really disappointed with the cancellation of two signature events here in South Niagara. Of course, Canal Days and Summerfest, um, two festivals that just wonderful festivals, really, um, you know, fun times, um, talk about community engagement, community spirit, uh, both are, are, are long time, well, Canal Day's a really long time um, festival and, and, and Summerfest has been around for a number of years as well. Can you guys talk about maybe plans for even 2020, uh, 2022, actually, uh, when we bring it back, right? Yeah. That's, that's the plan. At, at the moment, we're aiming for stuff in the fall, uh, where we certainly optimistically, like everyone else, think we're going to be back to, you know, something approximating former normal. Uh, but we certainly, uh, you know, what, what a blow both 
Summerfest and Canal Days, I mean, there's nothing not to love about both of those. The, the communities really shine and they're fun. Yeah, they're uh, fun. So I certainly look forward to next year uh, with, with Summerfest and I very much hope for Canal Days too because you should not miss that. Yeah, we're in the same boat. I mean, it was it broke our hearts to have to cancel it twice, but it was just the right thing to do. In Port Colborne, I've been going to Canal Days, obviously, since way before, like living in Port Colborne for 12 years. I've been going since before um, before I worked there. And, and sometimes we confuse Canal Days with the concerts because the concerts are so great, but there's so much more to Canal Days with West Street and the, the Empire Sandy, the Fireboat from Buffalo, the Museum Grounds. Um, and, uh, you know, and I know there's folks out there who sort of like get it a dodge for Canal Days, but the, the vast majority just love it. I, one of my favorite things is I, drive, I walk down this street behind City Hall and every year there's a gentleman there who has a pickup truck and he's turned the back into uh, like basically a hot tub with, for his kids. And the kids are swimming in the back of the pickup truck. It's, it's a homecoming for a lot of folks who've moved out of Port Colburn or who have friends who have been here in the past and come back. Um, the, the bands, we were, we were heartbroken, like I said, for 2020 because we had great bands lined up and we're not typically allowed to announce them. The, the announcement is embargoed by the artist because they're on tour and they want to sell tickets for their other for their other locations. So we were able to extend them to 21, same bands, same nights, Friday and Saturday. And then we did it again for 2022. So these great bands that we have are coming. The Empire Sandy contract, I just signed it yesterday. We, we took our deposit from last year to this year to next year. So it's gonna be the same great festival as always with improvements because we're still working away. Our parks department's working away at our waterfront areas and planting trees and gardens and. We have benches now on West Street that overlook the, the working ship canal. So we're, we're hoping to be back better and better than ever next year. And like David, like Pelham, we're kind of hoping we can get into some small scale events in uh, September, October before winter comes this year. But, you know, it just remains to be seen if we can or not. But we would love to gather as a community again. Yeah, parties are uh, parties are going to be important, I think, moving forward. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you, you, we talk about Canal Days and, um, you know, some of our listeners may not understand that, that Port Colborne is a real port community. Like you're right on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Lake Erie, you've got a beautiful marina and, um, and a lot of businesses that, that really feed into that whole, um, uh, into the canal. Uh, I know that uh, the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority uh, made an announcement, I think it was late last year, uh, partnership uh, with three of our uh, canal municipalities, so Thorold, Welland and Port Colburn. Uh, I know that the news was very exciting and uh, we've talked about it a little bit since, but Scott, what, um, what does that partnership mean um, to Port Colburn and some of the businesses that are really a part of that um, shipping industry? Yeah, so I, I hope my signal is okay. I got a little message on my screen. So if you can hear me, uh, I'll keep talking. Um, good. So we are working on a memorandum of understanding, an MOU between the city and the Hamilton Port Authority. We're not there yet. Council has to sort of satisfy themselves that we're on the right track with the partnership. Um, so maybe that happens in the next little while. Maybe it doesn't. We've already started to see them doing some work in Thorold and along the canal down here. Um, they do own some land. I, I, I think it's public knowledge that Hopa owns a little bit of land down in Niagara that they're working on, um, you know, sort of doing the same things they do in Hamilton. For us, it's the whole it's the whole canal. I mean, it is a working ship canal, like you've said. I think it's kind of part of the charm of Port Colburn. It's, you know, like Niagara Lake has the river and has the, the lake, but we have the canal, which is actually yeah. active. And um, from... Uh, from some of the investment that's been made down on Barber Drive, north of the Main Street Bridge, all the way to where, you know, there's some ship recycling and uh, metal recycling on the canal. There's some grain elevators and mills on the canal. And uh, to see those things happen, it's just, to me, part of the economy and it's part of the employment lands that are available in the city. So if the partnership happens with HOPA, I think the idea is that we'll be able to sort of bring on more employment lands and have more prosperity for the community if council decides to pursue that. I always, you know, you drive through town and in the summertime, a, a raised bridge means you're, you're going to have to find another way over the canal or you're going to have to wait for 20 minutes or so. 
and it can be frustrating in our day to day lives. But I think it, I think of it as as the cash register opening and closing because that's good for the economy of Port Colborne and really all of Niagara. So it's it's if you uh, to de stress yourself if you're stopped by a bridge, just think about the economic impact of the canal. For sure. And I can tell you that uh, at our Port Cobra and uh, Wingfleet Chamber, we still do get calls regularly from folks who want to come down and see see the locks and when are the ships going through. And uh, so it's still quite, quite an attraction uh, for folks. So, um, yeah, well put. Um, now, Dave, I think it's fair to say um, that there is quite a building boom happening in South Niagara. And um, I mean, Palom has certainly... <laughs> exploded. I, I can't think of another word. So how are, are you guys, you, you know, managing all of this development and, and how are you keeping up with the infrastructure and um, everything that comes along with, you know, that kind of, that kind of growth? Well, they're, the bottom line is they're good problems to have. For sure. And what I say to staff and what I say to council is, understand that when you're in a really high growth mode, you still have problems. They are, honest to God, challenges, but they're the good kind, uh, as, as opposed to, you know, uh, two municipalities ago, I worked at a place that had 0.23% growth one year and 024 the next. It couldn't manage a quarter of a percent mm -hmm. of growth. Uh, so no vitality whatsoever. And those are true problems because there you have to cut all the time just to try to maintain right. uh, because inflation is a real thing. So you, you try to reduce your service level. Uh, so how do we do? Well, you know, the first thing I can say is that growth is paying for virtually everything in Pelham. I mean, the growth rates, uh, the growth numbers are so good. Last year, we uh, came in at 2.83% new Understand that's new buildings across the board, be they commercial, residential, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and that was with us being shut down for two months of not issuing building permits or doing inspections. So that was a 10 month year. And that was the spring, by the way, we were shut down, which is the peak as far as, uh, you know, new construction activity. And so we, we lost the best two months of the year and we still came in at almost 3%. Um, so what it what it does to uh, we we our staff complement has increased. Uh, council has seen uh, that the challenge and the, the stresses, really the work demands were just too much. We, we weren't going to be able to meet our statutory deadlines as far as processing applications and the like. Uh, beyond that, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Louis and I are working on together with a couple of other municipalities is looking at trying to find a way to share uh, sort of our building inspection services to see, isn't there a, you know, uh, if you partner with some of the rural municipalities, they have the specific times in agriculture when you're more likely to be building and other times when you're less likely to be building. Uh, and so could we move some of the staff around to uh, when uh, uh, Pelham needs help and alternatively uh, when we could possibly free up some staff to go back and help. So, you know, we're looking at ways to cooperate with each other uh, to try to not increase our cost structure and not necessarily increase our staff complement, but find a way to share back and forth these skilled professionals we have on staff. Uh, so that's been part of it. Uh, and, and the rest of it is, I think the community is in a growth phase that's not going to stop anytime soon. And I think fundamentally at the end of the day, uh, we're also going to have to keep growing as a municipal corporation. The reality is if you have 3% more roads in a given year, 3% more houses, 3% more water being consumed, 3%. That's one year. The year before was 3.35. So between those two years, that's 6% growth. You don't necessarily need to grow your staff by 6%, but you probably can't grow it by zero or you can't meet the, you're not plowing the roads quickly enough. You're not plowing the sidewalks or whatever it happens to be. Your fire response time is down, all of those things. So the reality is, as the community grows, I think we, we too need to grow and our councils recognize that. Uh, and I think it's likely to continue. Yeah, it's uh, it's just amazing what's happened in Pelham. And, and I swear every time it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll go for a drive, I'll drive by a uh, couple days later, I'll drive by again. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the entire landscape has changed. I, yeah. I swear to God, a couple of years ago, Tim Hortons appeared overnight. Like it just, 
popped up. It was there. One day it wasn't, the next day it was. It was uh, incredible. And, and Scott, I know that there's uh, some of that happening in, in uh, Port Colborne as well. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, Port Colborne and, and there's actually two things, I think, that are happening at the same time that are of interest to the, to the whole region as well as the city. And one is the development, uh, I don't want to use the, the word, the negative word pressure, but like the, the development interest, let's call it. And sometimes, you know, from the time that a design comes in until the time a shovel hits the ground, it's a long period of time that has elapsed. But there are, we're getting a ton of inquiries in our ECDEV office on, on um, development subdivisions and so on. And I think it's important that there's a good mix of housing stock, you know, uh, so that we're making sure that we have rental units available, low cost units available, as well as, you know, some density, getting a lot of people into a small area, as well as uh, meeting the demand for, you know, the, 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 the sort of suburban living that we have available to us. But the second thing that's happening at the same time is the, uh, the phenomenon of sort of seeing people move but I guess there's a word for it. What do they say? Uh, as, as far as you can afford to drive basically or buy, you know, so people are moving out of the GTA mm -hmm. to the point where it's affordable to own and still drive. And I think Zoom and virtual meetings and working from home is having an impact on that. But what I'm seeing in, in, in our municipality is a shifting demographic. We're getting more uh, young families. We're getting, you know, couples with two kids. So the house has four people now instead of two retired people empty nesters. So I think I can't speak for Pelham, but I know that Port Colburn and some parts of Niagara in the past have had sort of an aging population, but I'm starting to see that shift. And with that brings more, you know, amenities, more things like spray pads and farmers markets and supper markets. And, and so it's a really exciting time, I think for Niagara that we're getting sort of an, an injection of new residents. And I think we're going to see you know, the impacts of that in, in, in the future of these municipalities. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, in the past, Niagara was always the place you wanted to visit, right? Yeah. You, you come down for a weekend, you, you check out Niagara Falls, you check out Niagara in the Lake, you hit the wineries, maybe you hit the beaches. And, and Scott, Lou, we were coming back to talk about beaches, oh, be okay. sure. But, uh, but now <laughs> it's the place that people really want to live. And uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. We um, Early on in our podcast um, uh, series, we talked to a, a couple of real estate people. And, uh, you know, they said folks that are coming from the GTA uh, have never seen anything like it. And, and we can see it in, in the uh, prices, right? It's yes. reflected in the prices. Um, but interesting, too. I mean, we're starting to build condos. Um, so in Palom, I, I think the condo developments are sold out before they they even break ground we've had at least two and i want to say three but i couldn't testify to that uh in a row that have been sold before the shovels broke the ground 100 percent sold out uh before the shovel hits the ground and uh so, so absolutely what you're saying is is correct yeah yeah the demand yeah. is strong the demand is strong and um you know just interesting to see the different types of of um, housing that we're now um, incorporating into our communities. Cause you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, a condo in Pelham, I, I don't know. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Okay, uh, Mr. Louie, uh, I told you we were gonna come back to talk about beaches. Um, for people who don't know, uh, Port Coburn, our South Coast. So, you know, uh, Fort Erie, Port Coburn, uh, Wayne Fleet, has some of the most beautiful beaches um, you, you'll find anywhere. Um, and last year there was a little bit of controversy about who could go to the beach and who couldn't go to the beach. And, and, um, and that's always a, a balancing act for, for you guys. So what is the plan for our beaches this year? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you very much. So <laughs> on the spot too. It's not a popular, not a popular answer. So we have, so we have two municipal beaches. One is called Cedar Bay Centennial Park and one is Nickel Beach. Very, very well known. Nickel Beach is a great beach that uh, one of the last ones in Ontario, you can actually drive your vehicle on. So it's a paid beach. And technically I guess you're paying for parking, 
So a, a beach user will pay for their car. You drive up, park it on the sand, and, and have your great, hopefully physically distant, uh, during the pandemic day at the beach. Cedar Bay Centennial is a little bit more quaint. It's out between Fort Erie and Waynefleet at the end of Vimy Ridge Road. And uh, there's a parking lot there, playground, tennis courts, and a small beach. Um, we also have a handful of road allowances. And these are just roads that dead end at the lake. And the city technically owns the 66 feet of road allowance up to the water's edge. Uh, I strongly encourage, at least during the pandemic and maybe beyond that, council is doing a study on how the public can access these areas. But right now there's no garbage facilities, there's no washrooms, there's no parking. In fact, there's no parking signs along the road. Uh, it's not the best place to spend a day at the beach. So please go to Nickel Beach or, or Cedar Bay. Um, Wildwood Road and Pleasant Beach Road, there is a little bit of parking. So that's uh, a little bit more suitable for public gathering. So we're gonna, run Nickel Beach fully wide open for the public from Niagara and beyond. And I'm going to pull up my screen here so I have my right notes. Um, Port Colborne residents will be able to use Nickel Beach for free. Uh, and we guarantee that they'll have a spot. So we're going to hold it, it, the, the Port Colborne residents don't need to be afraid that they won't get on the beach because out of towners did get on the beach. We will make sure that there are spots for them. Uh, they'll be done by a beach pass, which you have to apply for from City Hall, but with your qualifying Port Colborne address, we'll issue you a card that gets you on the beach for free all summer. They can do that online? So, uh, that's right. There's a request line. We've already fulfilled over 2,000 of them, um, and they're, uh, they're, like I said, they're a free pass for both parks. Niagara residents, we're charging a parking fee. It's $20 at Nickel Beach on weekdays. 25 on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Nickel. We're asking for people to pre-register online. So go to the city's website and you'll find a section where you can book a spot at the beach. It's, uh, it's a great way of doing it and us knowing how many people are going to be there before they get there. Uh, $5 extra on weekdays. Oh, sorry. Uh, they can go to Cedar Bay for 25. Now on Weekends, Friday, sorry, sat Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and statutory holidays, $25 at Nickel, $35 at Cedar Bay. And lastly, non-Niagara. So this is our folks who are joining us from the GTA. We love to have them. It's a little bit difficult during the pandemic. Um, and so we have to sort of make sure we manage the volume. Uh, $50 per car load on weekdays, $55 on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And just because of the space limitations, we are not permitting those folks to go to Cedar Bay. There's just a, not enough parking there and not enough staffing there. So we have staff at all of these beaches and they will help folks get on the beaches. So just after, uh, I know I'm saying, I'm sharing a lot here, uh, but just after this call, I'm actually going on a call um, with our emergency op, uh, control group. Uh, we call it EOC, Emergency Operations Center. And we're gonna sort of try to go through the provincial announcements from yesterday and see if they if they um, permit beaches to open and when they'd be permitted to open. So as of right now, we're closed. We actually have staff at both public beaches turning people away because it it's a restriction. And again, don't shoot the messenger. It's a provincial restriction on gathering and using public spaces. Um, the tough thing is they, they often don't say beaches are closed. They have in the past but they sometimes say outdoor recreation areas are open or closed. And then it's left to us to determine that I need a lawyer. Like Pelham, Pelham has a CAO for a lawyer, a lawyer for a CAO. <laughs> well, you know, during the pandemic, uh, especially people are really looking for those outdoor things that they can do. Uh, you know, beaches is certainly one of them. Uh, trails, walking trails is another bike trails is another. And I know that the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority is actually pushing for more integrated trails across Niagara. Uh, David, can, can, can you speak to that a little bit? I can, I should lead off with Pelham's uh, gonna keep its beaches closed for the summer. <laughs> um, it, 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 was a, it was a short conversation, I'll say that. <laughs> no but, beaches uh, Pelham, I, folks. <laughs> we think the, uh, the conservation authority is on to uh, we suspect a, a really brilliant proposal 
Uh, obviously, there's a, an existing level of integration of trails in Niagara. No one can deny that. You can go up and down the canal, uh, obviously, north, north to south. And there's reasonably good connectivity in the east along, uh, along the river. But uh, that being said, there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, Pelham's really proud of its trail system. Uh, our, we don't actually have data. We're looking at purchasing technology that will give us uh, like pedestrian trail counts. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I think we're going to get there because uh, what we do have in the winter were photographs of the footprints through the snow along our, our tra- and it's incredible. And anecdotally, our staff are out there and, you know, it, it's got to be about triple uh from two years ago. So it, the, the growth is exponential and it's not just because our community is growing. Uh, certainly it's, you know, a healthy, good activity you can do to get in touch with nature and sort of center yourself during these sort of uh, stressful, uh, hard days, right? Um, so the NPCA's uh, initiative to sort of look at interconnectivity and increase that connectivity, I think will be great for tourism. Sort of a nice thing is ec- economic development. But more importantly, I think it's just good for the health of our residents and our guests. And uh, certainly, I think we're going to be throwing uh, corporately some weight behind that and uh, look to cooperate with our, our neighbors. I mean, we have a, a good trail that heads into Welland. Uh, we have some problems with our connectivity up to Thorold's trails. So this is something uh, certainly the I think the municipality can be involved with. I don't know uh, the specifics of uh, where Port Colburn is going with those, but uh, for us, we think it's a really good initiative and, and has a way to improve quality of life for everyone here in Niagara. Yeah, I love that Stephen Bauer Trail. I, I use it regularly. It's a, it's a great trail. It goes on forever. Uh, Mr. Louie, did you want to add yeah, anything I mean, to that? Nothing specific. We, uh, we Trails are a super huge priority for us. Um, we have a trail that sort of takes along the, the Port Colborne Promenade through H.H. Knoll Park and and up down uh, behind Sugarloaf and around to the canal and you can go right up West Street. Uh, we also connect to Fort Erie through the Friendship Trail to Waynefleet. There's, uh, there's some over the road connectivity, not the trail sort of stops, but uh, the Gord Harry Trail that goes all the way to Haldeman County. And, uh, and then we're part of the Circle Route as well with a trail that goes around uh, the series Global Plans, that's the former Robin Hood, and along the canal up into D- Dane City. And in fact, we're investing some yes. money in that. We were given some COVID funding by the, I think it's 8020 Federal Provincial for recovery. And, and sort of politically in, in, in Port Colburn, our council is strongly feels that recreation and, and getting out into um, into the outdoors is part of is going to be part of the pandemic recovery for our residents. So we're investing in paving part of that trail with that grant money that will take folks or allow folks to, to connect Dean City and Port Colburn along the Welland Canal. So we're really looking forward to that capital project this year. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. Mr. Lund, I don't know. I, I have so many more, <clears throat> excuse me, questions that I want to ask. Uh, you, you know, so many topics that we haven't covered, but I I think we're running out of time. Yeah. We're pretty close. We're getting we're getting on there. Uh, I do have one quick question, just and and we'll get you to do it uh, quickly, gentlemen. But uh, it, eventually, this thing is going to come to an end. And if the province is right, and you know, there looks like you know, depending on the amount of people vaccinated, come August, you know, we could be turning things around. Quickly. So not only will there be some, I guess, I don't want to say expansion, but a plan to come back. Now you've got to come back and you have less people than when you normally would. So you've got a big challenge ahead in terms of staffing and um, and everything that goes along with that, which creates budgetary fun and all kinds of stuff. So uh, as we wrap up as the last question, uh, and I'll start with you, David, because uh, we should also mention that you did win the uh, Ontario Municipal Administrator Association Award of Achievement. So that's pretty darn cool. Uh, congrats on that. Uh, and now maybe you can explain uh, what you're going to do to <laughs> to keep going moving forward. Well, uh, you know, council's looking at this and has a has some some choices before it. But uh, my answer is that I really think. I, I don't believe uh, that it's we're at the end of the road for cities. I, I should start with that. I don't think downtown cords are going to be hollowed out. I think human beings enjoy being social. And 
over human history, we've congregated the cities. So I don't see that stopping because of COVID. Uh, but what you do see is technology, certainly the pandemic's proven we can work from home, uh, maybe not full time, but at least, uh, you know, partial. And that's something we certainly found with a number of our staff. Uh, a lot of our jobs can be done one day a week from home, two days a week from home, sometimes three. Uh, when you're working with a computer in particular, it, it just lends itself to that. So I think a bunch of our future, uh, you know, Pelham's value proposition is that it's just wonderful and beautiful to live amongst apple orchards and cherry orchards and hiking trails and Short Hills Park and, and so it goes. So why not operate your technology business, uh, your, your service economy, uh, uh, industry, whatever that happens to be, from a, a place that's wonderful and beautiful to live? And I think that's uh, a really good avenue forward for us uh, as, as, as we head into the unknown. Uh, Town Council has supported applications to bring uh, high-speed wireless to the very few parts of our rural area that aren't well served. And we think the SWIFT project, uh, we aren't alone. I'm sure, I, most of Niagara is involved in that. I'm sure Port Colburn is. But we think there's more high-speed coming to the, the few areas that don't really have it. Uh, and when that happens, then I really see no reason why you wouldn't operate a software business, a consulting business, a marketing firm from a, a wonderful, beautiful spot to live. And I think that's something we can uh, bottle and market to the world. Very nice. Yeah. Awesome. Scott, how about Parkle? Yeah, I'll take a different approach selfishly, Scott, if that's okay with you. Uh, you know, we have a strategic plan that's going before council next council meeting. That's Tuesday. And uh, it has a lot of um, components of it that are about us performing at a very high level, the city and city staff performing at a high level and providing high quality ser services, amenities, uh, you know, and, and, and everything else. And, but the approach I want to take, and, you know, I, I certainly don't expect anyone to feel sorry for my staff and I. Uh, I know it's been very tough sledding out there in the public, or sorry, private sector and out there in the corporate world. Um, you know, some, some, some businesses had to make some tough choices and, and had huge revenue impacts because of the pandemic. But I can't say enough about how good our guys and girls were throughout the, the whole pandemic. Um, we, have, we have essential workers, water and wastewater, um, cemeteries and fire department are absolutely essential but the province said municipalities are essential. So the person who sends you your tax bill, even though you don't probably want it, the person who gives you your library <laughs> books, the person who cuts grass in parks, those are all essential workers. And some of them had some tough times in the pandemic too. Um, unfortunately, in the era of social media, you, your, your 99 greatest hits go un, un, unnoticed, but your one miss sometimes is the subject of a, of a Facebook post. And, so if you empty 99 garbages, but one is overflowing, you get, you get, you know, in trouble on Facebook. If you, if you mow 99 parks and one park has long grass, you get in trouble on Facebook. So uh, some of our staff were a little bit demoralized during the pandemic because they felt like they were doing everything right, but being judged sort of unfairly. And one of the things that we had because of the lockdowns, everyone was at home. So people who normally weren't even in the city in the daytime because they were at their job, we're all of a sudden like, why is it so noisy here? There's, there's, there's construction taking place. There's machines out on the road. Well, that stuff was always happening, but it was happening sort of in the background. And we really came to the forefront. So I'd encourage anybody. And like I said, I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for you, but my folks are essential workers, just like nurses, just like doctors. And hey, we're not putting needles in arms and we're not working in ICUs, but we're part of the framework. And if you know somebody who works in any municipality in Niagara, I think give them a pat on the back for the last year and a half because a lot of them stepped up and answered the bell. And we'll continue. Absolutely. So my, answer is, my answer is we'll continue to do that beyond the pandemic and we're going to be back at it better than ever. Fantastic. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, it's going to a lot of work ahead, but uh, a lot of positive things, uh, you know, coming, coming down the pipe for sure. As we, as we pull our, our way through this, uh, Scott, Louie, David Cripps, thanks so much for uh, spending the hour with us and, and, and some great information and, uh, and enjoy the long weekend. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure. Be well. Dolores, what's up next week?
Well, next week we're going to be welcoming Michelle Biscop, Director of Operations for the Niagara River Lions, uh, Joey Burke, General Manager of the Niagara Ice Dogs, and Ryan Harrison, CEO for the Welland Jackfish. Three great local teams representing three beloved sports here in Niagara. Mm -hmm. We'll learn about their challenges this past year and uh, what they have planned for fans this coming season. To all of our listeners, tell us about the topics that you're talking about because we want to talk about it too. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, have yourselves a wonderful long weekend.